Hello and welcome to GCAF Online. We are so glad that you are here this Sunday, worshiping God together with us. And it's a great privilege wherever we are right now that we could still gather in our homes, listening to the Word of God. And so our text for this day is found in Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. Matthew 21, 33 to 46. And Jesus is speaking here. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine, a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce, his produce, I think. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. But afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? And they said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. Jesus said to them, Did you never read the Scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. But when they sought to seize him, they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. Let's pray. Lord, help us listen to your word the way we ought to listen, that you are God and you're speaking even today, Lord, to your people through your word, the Bible. And so I pray that we, you would take away anything that is distracting us right now. Any, any uh, concerns right now, I pray, O oh Lord, that we would focus our mind, capture every stray thought, corral our feelings to listen and, and so, uh, center on you, O oh Lord. And I pray that as the words, your word, O oh Lord, would be preached today, you, Holy Spirit, O oh Lord, work the only work that you alone can do, and that is to pierce through bone and marrow. It is to pierce through stubborn hearts. It is to pierce through stubborn minds and make alive what is sleeping and what is dead. I pray that our worship you would find to be true in the end. In Jesus' name, amen. So what are we talking about here? And it's been a, it's a long passage that I just read. It's, it's one uh, parable that Jesus said, and, and there was that reaction to it, and Jesus asked them a question, and they responded, and Jesus gave them 
the, the explanation, and there was a final response. But what is Jesus' point here? What is He talking about here? Now, if you have been following with us through the Sundays, we have been talking and, and going through Matthew, the whole book of Matthew. Basically, we started with Matthew chapter 5 way last year, and now we are in Matthew 21. And we have been doing this verse by verse, and as a, as a result, here as a church, we have seen the, the, the entirety of the point and the journey of Jesus and what has been His ministry. And so, last week, we, we see that, that Jesus was preaching a parable in response to a confrontation that, that, that the lead, religious leaders at that time confronted Him with. They were, they were asking Jesus, Jesus, show us your proof that you can teach here. Show us your credentials, right? And in response, Jesus gives them a series of parables, three parables, a trilogy. If you, you're, We're all familiar with trilogies, right? The Lord of the Rings, the Star Wars trilogies. Jesus gave them a trilogy of parables. And this is the second one. And see, this is the last week. The Holy Week, we know it today, but this was the last week of Jesus' life on earth. It, the, the day that He said this parable was a Wednesday. On Friday, He was going to die. They were going to kill Him. And it's this furious religious leaders that have been, you know, following Him, checking uh, hoping against hope that, they, that Jesus would make a mistake and, and they would pounce on Him. They're, they're laying traps. They're, they're testing Him. And they're asking now His credentials, right? And, and so, we, we see that they're so angry because Jesus has been denouncing their religion. Jesus has been turning upside down their lifestyle, their way of life. Jesus has been showing them that their outward righteousness was false. It did not honor God. And they were so angry with Jesus because He was a threat to them. He was a threat to what they have been enjoying until that point. Power, respect from people, being looked on as holy and righteous people. And they're so angry because Jesus has been attacking their religion. And so, last Sunday, the message that Pastor Jay preached to us was that the, the, about the lies that we tell ourselves, that even though there, maybe in some part of us we know that there are things that we're doing that are not right, it is, but because of our outward, the, the good things that we do on the outside, our religious works, our religious traditions, we could still go to church and feel good about ourselves that we're doing something good. But their lifestyle was showing to others. And Jesus was pointing that out, that your lifestyle shows what kind of faith you have. Your lifestyle right now shows you what kind of faith that you have. And again, if you've been joining with us through the months here, Jesus, of all people, has been preaching, teaching, and exposing false faith, false religion. And He's saying there is only one type of worship, one type of faith that God will honor. They had faith, they said. They had faith but it was a dead kind of faith. They had a very lively form of worship, but it was a worship that God rejected. And this is Jesus' reply now. And this is, so I'll tell, title this sermon, The Case Against Those Who Reject Christ. Jesus is warning us today and Jesus has warned even His audience then about the consequences of continually rejecting the truth of Jesus Christ. 
the truth of His Word. You see, today, we, we can still distinguish between what is a, a real Christian and who is not. A real Christian is marked by certain qualities, the Bible tells us. And one of those qualities is that he has a love for the truth of God. He, he loves the Word of God. He loves the Scriptures. He knows that it is his life. Just like when, G, when Peter said, there's nowhere else for us to go. You have the words of life. You are life. And that's the mark of real Christianity that you, you are tuning in today. Some of you, and, and, and some of you are saying, I, I need to hear the Word of God. This is, this is my only anchor in this life. And, and some of you, you know that even though you're listening, even though you're coming and, and, and tuning in, there is a sort of no interest, and no, no, nothing, no love for the Word. And you're just here because of a religious tradition that you have to do. There is a mark. And Jesus is warning us even today as an act of grace. There is a case against those who will continue to reject Christ. And we can thank God that our faith is built on a solid rock of truth. That th what happened on this week really happened. Jesus did come on this earth. You have thousands of years of Christians testifying the truth. These are first-hand witnesses that we are reading right now. The, the, the inspired words of Scripture were first-hand witnesses. They have seen for themselves. They have heard for themselves the truth of Jesus. And so we know that it is true. We know that it has happened. We know in our changed lives, ourselves, that what they said was true. We know with the seal of the Holy Spirit that it is indeed true. And so, you would see here that when, when Jesus explains this parable, He's building a case against those who will reject Him come Friday, who was rejecting Him even today, that why was He arrested? Why, were, why did the Jewish leaders just simply reject Him? Why did the Romans kill Him? And why did he, even His followers become so frightened that they ran away? Well, here's the... The first thing that God, that Jesus did in his parable, he builds the case by first establishing ownership. Who's, who's, who owns the world? Who owns this vineyard? And so we see that in verse 33, he says, listen to this parable, another one, the second one, okay? He says, there was a landowner. And we know that this is God. See? So there was a landowner. He's, he's the owner here, right? And he's, he's, Jesus, right from the beginning, establishes ownership. You know, if you read your Bibles and you love your Bibles, you know in, in the first book of Genesis, God establishes who the creator is, who the owner of the entire universe is, who is the owner of your life. And so he, there you see that, that God is a careful planner. He's a generous God. And so you see in verse 33, he says, the landowner plants the vineyard. He chooses from the best vines and plants it in this land. And he even puts a, a wall of protection around it. He, he digs a wine press to make it pro product, productive so that it, there would be fruit and much fruit that would come out and be turned into something that would be benefit to everybody. And, and he builds a tower, and a tower is used for defense. It's a tower is used for storage, and a tower is used for protection as well. And what does he do? He, by his generous nature, rents it out to vine growers who, have, who can't afford this. Vine growers who don't even deserve to be put there. He, he, God chooses these vine growers and says, Hey, guys, we are now going to enter into a contract with each other. See, this landowner, generous, calls out these vine growers and enters into contract with them. I'm going to rent it out to you. All you have to do is 
work on this land and give to me what is due to me. That's the contract. And so, what happens is in verse 34, when the harvest time approached, the owner sends his slaves to the vine growers just as they had agreed so that he could receive his produce. That's the contract. Now here's the problem. This is the case against the response of man or the vine growers. Man breaks the contract. He does not he is not faithful with their agreement. And, and you can really imagine no? the, the audacity, how, how thick their, their, their skins are. And here in the, in, in the Philippines, we have a, a, a term for another one, a bagag right? they, 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 don't, they don't feel the shame of what they're doing. And, and we know that there is a tendency that even if you don't own it, you would think it is your right. See, the roads in the Philippines are, 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 most of them are narrow, the side streets, right? And so, the, the, we know that the streets are not ours. But here's the, what human nature. Well, it's, out, it's just in front of my house. I have many things, right? So, I will take a portion of that road and use it for myself. Now, here's what happens. It is a privilege, the road is. You didn't build it. We didn't spend for it. We didn't develop it. But what happens? There is a tendency in the heart of man to, to claim what is not his and to become possessive about it. Even, so what happens? Maybe in, in the road streets, somebody would say, Sir, ma'am, you can't have that in your street. And you would get angry. Because why? Well, this is my right. This is my property even though it's not. So, it's, do you think it, it only existed then? No. Human nature, this is our heart, right? And so, it's common. Even today, you'd see many examples of that. Either you're in the jeepney and somebody is taking your, your precious personal space and you say, hey, don't sit too close to me, right? Or, or when you're driving or whatever in, in life, there is still that tendency for us to claim what is not even ours for ourselves. And so man breaks their contract because they're thinking, well, we are the ones who are working in this land. We are the ones who have been uh, bleeding here. We've been working hard here. So even if you now ask us for doing nothing, there's a tendency that many of us would feel, no, you don't deserve it. I do. And so they don't give. What is due to the landowner? And what they do instead is to mistreat and abuse the servants. Maybe in the beginning, it was just saying no to the servants. But they kept coming back. And so maybe there was an, they, they ignored, right? Sir, bam, it's time to collect. And they would just ignore these servants. And maybe because of their persistence of the servants, they would... In, in, uh, became angry later on. And they got angry because the servants would say, hey, you have to give what is, your, is due to the owner. That's not yours. You're just here because of a privilege given. There was an agreement. And now they're angry. And they're, they start to beat them. And they will start to kill them later on. See, the vine growers in verse 35 would take his, the, the owner's slaves and they would beat one and they would kill another and they would stone a third. And you can say, how, how can they, these guys do it? They, that's, that's evil. But it really happened. You look in the Old Testament. Read the Old Testament. This has, was a norm. This was how they would treat the prophets of God because we know that the, the servants here, the slaves here are the prophets of God. They are the, the, the God, what, who God would send in behalf to speak in behalf of Him to His people. And so, example here would be Jeremiah. What did He do to Jeremiah? They threw Him into a pit 
And in tradition says that ultimately they stone him to death. What happened to Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel? They rejected Ezekiel. Amos, the prophet Amos, had to run for his life, had to escape because when he delivered the message to his people, they, God's people, they became so angry at him that they wanted to kill Amos. And Zechariah, prophet Zechariah himself was rejected and was stoned as well. They did this. They did this a lot. And in fact, I'll show you 1 Kings 22, 24. Here, there was this, the, the king, uh, the, or then Zedekiah, the son of Chenana, came near and struck prophet Micaiah on the cheek because simply because he was so angry at what the prophet was saying. He smashes his cheek. This is how they were mistreating. But here, Despite how wicked, how ungrateful, how unfaithful these vine growers were, you would see that Jesus is say, stating to them the nature, the gracious nature of God, the owner. He's saying God would keep giving them chance and chance again. Maybe they'll change their mind this time. I'll send another slave. Maybe I'll change another, they'll, their mind this time. I'll send them another servant. Right? And we know in 36, verse 36, he sends another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same exact thing. Maybe some of you have been going through uh, a survey of the Bible that we've, we've been teaching our wider group leaders here. And we saw, right, in one of those lessons that there was just this huge stacks of the books of prophets, from major prophets to minor prophets, you would see that their role was to what exactly what Jesus is saying here. God giving them chances and chances, sending them prophets after prophets to warn them, to remind them, give back to the owner what is his, what is due to him. And they would keep on refusing, refusing, and refusing these messengers. They would refuse God. They would be unfaithful because they thought that the privilege that they were given had become their right. Verse 37, but afterward, finally, the landowner says, okay, I'm finally going to send my only son to them, my son. And there's a huge difference here between servants and slaves and an owner's son himself. There is a huge difference with the worth, the value, the authority of these two, servant, slave, to a son. And here's what the owner is, is saying and is, is feeling, right? Surely they will respect my son. He is my own flesh and blood, Right? And here's the case against them. Not only are these people rejecting servants, they will see the son as an opportunity that the property that was rented out to them would become theirs by now killing the son. And so, in verse 38, we see that when they saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. Why, why are they saying that? Because tr they have a culture here that if you no longer have your own, uh, you don't have any heirs. When you die, the land that was, that was work, uh, the, that, uh, the, the people that was living in that land would own the land now. Because there was no, no heir, nobody to, the ownership would end with that family. And so they were thinking, we haven't seen the, the owner for a long time. He sends his son. Maybe, maybe the owner is dead and the only, his son is only left. So if we kill the son, this is going to be ours. And they, they, do, they do, they kill him. They took, in verse 39, they, they 
the, the vine grower, growers, they take the son, throw him out of the vineyard, and kills him. Now, this, remember, the, the, uh, the, the, the Jews then, in, in Jesus' time, they had a culture far different from ours. You see, right now, you're, you're, we, we are, we have, you're looking at me, you're listening to me through a gadget, right? A TV screen or a, 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 a phone or a tablet, whatever. But see, we have technology now that we can see videos. Before, there were no videos. There were no pictures. All you have is when a storyteller would come, when a teacher would come to them, they would have to listen Listen to the story. And pretty much the, the, the way their stories, right, the, the, was their entertainment as well as their education as well. And today, that, that's, we, see, we have videos. We have, our culture has trained us that when we don't like what we, we are looking at, we don't like what we are listening to, we can just easily flip a channel Right? And we would go to something more interesting. Now, remember, the audience of Jesus during this day are auditory. They're, they're listeners, right? They listen to stories. They are also versed in the crowd that, of this audience. Some of them are very well versed in the Old Testament. And they've heard stories about the Old Testament. So when this parable... When Jesus shares this parable, it's like, you know, you know what I'm talking about here? See, this is an illustration, a parable is. Uh, the way I communicate truth to my son, sometimes big, huge truth, is to relate to him something that he, he knows or he's very familiar with already. And the master teacher, Jesus does that. So, my son, for example, loves Minecraft, right? And so sometimes when I have to explain to him, when he, when he goes to me and daddy, what does this mean? Daddy, uh, what is this? And I will tell him, you know, like, like in Ma Minecraft, son, that when you, you go and, and, and you dig and you get something, you can build with it. And, and so I'm relating huge truth to him to something that he's familiar with. Maybe, and maybe some of you guys are scratching your head, what's Minecraft, right? And, and so I'll tell you, right? So it's like... Uh, you know, in Star Wars, when they would have their lightsabers out, and so you immediately know that what I'm talking about here, right? And that there would be just this Jedi's and all, right? And maybe some of you, you know, uh, are not familiar with that. And so, you know, when FPJ would come and he would beat the bad guys, you know, he would allow himself to be defeated uh, in the beginning of the movie and he would come back. You would immediately know what I'm talking about here. Because we're, we're start, I'm stating from something you're familiar with. So Jesus here is relating a truth to his audience that they would understand. And vineyards were all, all over their country. It was very common. The practice of a vineyard owner, vineyard owner, renting it out is very common practice. What was not common was the Hor hor horrible things the divine yard workers were doing. And it was not common, was how the owner would keep giving them chances after chances and would in fact send his only son knowing that they've all been beating, killing his servant so far. That was not the common thing here. But see, Jesus is actually basing it in something they're familiar with. Isaiah chapter 5. What does Isaiah chapter 5 say? And you would see really, if, if you were familiar with the Old Testament, just like the, his audience here, you would know that Jesus is talking about them. Isaiah 5 says, Let me sing now for my well-beloved a song of my beloved, here it is, concerning his vineyard. In fact, verse 7 could not make it more clear. Isaiah 5, 7, 
For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So the vineyard here is Israel. So clear. And, and, and the, the, they're listening here, and the vine owner, hey, that's us. Okay? The, the, vine, the vine workers, hey, that's us. And what, what he does? Very familiar. 5 verse 2. Chapter, Isaiah 5 verse 2. He, the, he dug it all around. God did. He removed its stones and planted it with the choicest vines. God builds a tower in the middle of it. Hews out a wine press, a wine vat in it. Now, here's the thing. You see, when God did that, there was a contract. There was an expectation. There was a responsibility given to the vine growers, to Israel. God expected it to produce good grapes. But what happened? It produced only worthless grapes, worthless fruits. In fact, God saying way back in Isaiah 5, 4, what more can I do for the, my vineyard, my beloved vineyard, that I have not done and the answer there is nothing. God has done everything, give, given them all the chances. Why, when I expected it to produce good fruit, good grapes, would it continuously produce worthless ones? Let's go back to our journey in Matthew. And you would really see the pattern here, the consistent pattern here of God, Jesus' message. Still, as the sun now, beseeching the vine, the vineyard, Israel. See, Matthew 21, 13, remember? The sun is saying, my house shall be called the house of prayer. But what is going on here? You're making it into a robber's den. You have twisted and, and made this, the worship in God's house, God's temple, into something unacceptable. Matthew 21, 19 says, you, you've seen this in last, last Sunday, right? Ron Ron preached about this. He says, there was a fig tree by the road. It had leaves, right? And you know, and everybody knows that when there's leaves, there has to be the fruit already of the fig because the fruit comes before the leaves. And so, he, Jesus, when he goes to the fig tree, and the fig tree we know is Israel, there was no fruit. No fruit. In Matthew 15, what does Jesus say about Israel, about the religion, about the religious leaders? He says, you hypocrites. You guys, a hypocrite is saying he loves God, but in reality, he doesn't. And Jesus is exposing it. He says, that's the bad fruit. See, good fruit is not saying you love God. Good fruit is loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And in 8 and 9, Matthew 15, 8 and 9, the people honors me with their lips. People honor, this people honors me with outward religion. But their heart is far away from me. And it's useless. They, their worship is useless to me. You see, that was the contract. Way back, it was given to them, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. The contract was worship God and God alone, love God and love God alone. That is what is due to the creator, to the owner. And Israel would keep on refusing it. And so, but God was gracious and He would still give them chance and still expect them eventually to produce the good grape, the good fruit. You remember in Matthew 13, 23, Jesus is saying, that only those that would produce good fruit 
are those who, who is a man, who is a woman, who will hear the word of God and believe it, understand it, accept it, would be those who would bear fruit, the good fruit. And you, just in case you forgot, there were four soils talked about here, and only one was real. Four different types of heart of people that accepted the Word of God, but only one proved to be true and acceptable to the Lord. Isn't that, again, a gracious warning from servants and the Son Himself? Give back to God what is His due. And so, we go back in the beginning. Matthew chapter 3. John the Baptist, who is a prophet, a servant of the owner. What is the message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And there was a result, right? There were many religious leaders, Pharisees and Sadducees, that came to John the Baptist because they were saying, seeing that a lot of people had come and they were, of course, feeling that it was the right thing to do. But what did, G what did John the Baptist say to them? You brood of vipers, you're here not because you love God, not because you're repenting. And he says to them, therefore, in verse 8, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And you might be saying, well, I have to do something. I have to repent so that I might be saved. Isn't, are you preaching here that you need to do something in order to be saved? I tell you, repentance is not a work that we do, but it is the fruit. See? I'll say it in another way, maybe. Repentance and faith are linked. The, you cannot separate them again, uh, against each other. They are still an act of faith. When you repent and believe, you're saying, believe in God. Have faith in God. It is still faith. You, without faith, true faith, you would not repent. And how do you know you have real faith? Because you are, have repented from your sins. Repentance is turning away from whatever you have hold precious, be it an ideology, a philosophy, something of an idol, and you, you turn to God. It is still faith. So the, the good fruit that God the owner wants from all of us is true faith in Jesus Christ. Let me point out to you John 12, 44. Jesus shouted to the crowds, If you trust me, you are trusting not only me, but also God who sent me. And John 4, 23. But an hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is seeking from the land true worshipers. Are you one? And don't miss this. This is so important. Because some pastors in big churches are saying this. They're saying that Jesus did not claim that he was God on earth, while he was here on earth. That's blasphemy. That's, that's heresy. You see here, Jesus is saying he is the Son of God. He is God. Don't believe in the lies even from when... when pastors that you like would tell you that. Point them, look at the scriptures and say, and choose who you will believe. 
that charismatic pastor, that popular pastor, that popular man or woman, or the Word of God, Scripture. And Jesus is warning us today of the consequence. There is a consequence. Jesus built a case against those who reject Christ, and He states and gives the warning of the consequence for those who will be found guilty for rejecting Him in the end. Verse 40, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? And his audience are so caught up with Jesus' story that all of them say, many of them are shouting, of course, he will bring, the landowner will bring those wretches to a wretched end. Those ungrateful, wicked people, the landowner will surely kill them. That's an evil thing that they're doing. And not only will he destroy them, will kill them, the landowner will transfer, will take, them, take the ownership away or take that vineyard away from them and give them out to other vine growers who will pay him the proper proceeds at the proper seasons. And we know today and can understand that it has been given to the church of Christ. Wherever we are in the world, if you belong to the true church of Jesus Christ, this is a privilege that we have, but there's still that responsibility to give back to God what is due to Him. But see here, there was, there, there was a, a mixed crowd that they, they said, no, 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 we, th- that should not be, right? Lo'y naman, ang vine growers, they're there for a long time. Right? But Jesus said to them, did you never read in scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. You know why there was a mixed reaction with when, when there, there was this uh, answer to Jesus' question, what will the uh, vine owner do to those vine growers that killed his servants and his son. Why? And, and this is still very common today. Because many would see this as uh, no harm, no foul, right? Uh, you can still forgive, right? You're a God of love, right? So it, it really doesn't matter, right? You can still give us another chance. And so maybe you're listening today. And the reason why you have not been giving back to God what is due to Him, you have not been not turning away from your sin that you keep running to, you keep hugging, and you keep returning to, is because you think, oh, this is not so bad. There's a lot of things that I do, right? So I'm sure God will give me a chance, another chance anyways. And so isn't that the same thing? that you are still refusing, you are still rejecting to give back to God what is due to Him, true worship. And so you're living out a a, a religious life, but inside your heart is far away from God because you have loved another idol. You have allowed another thing to replace God's rightful place. You're not giving to God what is due to Him. Did you know that your sin and I and mine, your sin and mine are the reason why Jesus the Son died for on the cross on Friday? And we're saying to ourselves, ah, I'm sure it's nothing big. That's the difference. You think it's not big, but the owner the landowner, this is the case for those who will reject God. It is the landowner's point of view. It is the landowner who's saying, this is the offense that you do if you do that. If you, you are rejecting, you are not giving to God what is due. 
And so there is a consequence if you do that. If you wait until it is too late, Jesus says, have you not read? Don't you know this? Meaning, there's already here in the Bible the chance. You can't, God has done everything for you already. He has left all for, for you so that all you need to do is believe. But if you don't believe, God said, the rejected stone will become the chief cornerstone that will be now the one that will destroy you in the end or make you fall. In verse 43, Jesus gives them the explanation. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and will give it to another. And the, those who are listening it, the leaders, religious leaders are saying, that Jesus is talking to us. Jesus is saying to them, you have lost the right to be in the place of blessing. Israel will no longer be the, the, the house of God, the, the nation of God at this point. It will be given to the church. Verse 44, and he who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. This is, hasn't happened yet. You see, when Jesus said this, it has not happened yet. Still another chance. Don't you see? When you're listening to this message today, God's judgment upon you has not happened yet. What's stopping you from believing? And if you don't believe today because you think there is a tomorrow, be careful, my friend. You don't know. You never know. What's the response of the current vine growers? What is the response of the religious leaders during Jesus' time? When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they understood that He was speaking about them. Don't you see how convicting that is? They understood that He was speaking about them. They understood that this man was the Son of God, but they did not want to believe Him. They did not accept Him. They rejected Him. And so what they did, they think, they thought, they're thinking, they, we want to capture Him and kill Him. But the only thing that held them back that day was that they feared the crowd of people because they considered him to be a prophet. Now, here's something I want you to understand. It's important here. These leaders had an agenda. Their concern. And what was their, their agenda? I'll show you so that you really see how evil and, and wicked the men's hearts are and how dangerous it is to follow this kind of men. John 11, verse 47. Therefore, the chief priest, you see what's happening behind the scene, and the Pharisees, con they, they convene a council. And this is a trial. They're, they're saying, what are we doing? They have, they're evaluating, right? So far, we've been following this Jesus for two years. We've done everything we can to stop him. It's been proven useless. We can't trap him with his words. He's too good. He knows what he's talking about. I think, and, and see, he's performing miracles. At this point, he, was, he raised Lazarus from the dead. For this man is performing many, many signs. And what is their fear? What is their concern? 48 tells us in John 11. If we let him continue, if we let him go on, everybody will believe in him. So they become afraid because when they would believe Jesus, what has Jesus been saying? Their religion is false. The, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are hypocrites. They would lose their, the, the people's respect. They would lose everything that they are clinging on and, and been enjoying so far. And they're saying now, the concern is a national level saying, the Romans, they, they're not going to stand still for this. They're going to come in because People are going to believe in a savior king and, and they will think that it is a national threat to them and they will take away our place and our nation. 
That's the fear. They were afraid that what they enjoyed would stop. The lifestyle that they had until that point would no longer be. They could not afford to give it up. They could not bear or want to give it up. And that's why they refused to believe in Jesus. And so what was the solution? Verse 49 of John 11, somebody named Caiaphas, who was the high priest of that time, the highest ranking priest, gave them a solution. You guys don't know anything. See, what you've been doing hasn't worked. This is how we should do it. Kill him so that we would save many. Sacrifice one just to save everybody else. And so that's how they convinced themselves to kill Jesus and it was all right. He's just one man. He's just, uh, even though he's a prophet, ah, it's okay. There's a lot of us here. We're priests. We're doing something good. We're thinking about the nation here. We're patriots. And they killed Jesus. So from that day on, they planned to kill him. Here's, here's the warning then. See, leaders who have evil motives. If, you're, if, you're, if you belong in a church and, and, and its leaders have different motives, evil motives, may, may I give you this. Be careful who you listen to because they might, one day, there might be an undercover hater. And what will this do? Remember, the crowd on Wednesday that believed him still to be a prophet became a minority on Friday. This is the Holy Week. Wednesday. This day was Wednesday. In a matter of days, these religious leaders would incite the crowd would convince the crowd through a false trial and, and all that Jesus was to be crucified and, and killed. Be careful of following leaders who have hidden evil motives. And that's why part of Jesus' message and the Scripture's message, you would know good fruit because uh, the good tree because they are producing good fruit. You would know what is, who is a real teacher, who is a real Christian from a fake Christian. Do not be deceived. You would see Scripture giving the responsibility back to you. And many of you have been so concerned with what's been going on in the past few months that many of you would scrounge around the internet and, and listen to prophets, listen to doomsday speakers, and you would say, oh, I'm so scared. Oh, this is going to happen. Oh, what's going to happen, right? And, and, and so, because what's the respons who's responsible here? God gives back the responsibility to you. Do not be deceived. Those who will be deceived are those who do not look into Scriptures but would listen to others. Later on in Matthew, Jesus would preach more about that. But that is the warning. Don't listen to everybody, just anybody out there. Don't just follow blindly. There are blind guides leading. And you would be blind, right? You would be blinding yourself if you're allowing blind guides to lead. Because that's what the Bible describes as blind guides leading the blind. Not only are leaders leading you, I'm telling you, be careful to when you, how you listen to yourself. Today, you are talking to yourself. Yesterday, you have been talking to yourself. All these weeks and all these months, you have been talking to yourself. How do you talk to yourself? Thoughts, emotions come, right? When, you, when, when you're looking, when you're concerned, all this worry, all, all anger or envy would, would come and you would talk to yourself and you become, right? And if you listen, if you don't listen to God, again, the warning of Hebrews, remember? You will drift away. There's a slowly drifting away if you don't listen to God and you start listening to something else, somebody else. So somebody said this, you are exactly where you have, where you are, where you have chosen to be. 
by the people you associate with and the things you have been watching, reading, and hearing. Be careful how you listen. Jesus is warning us that there is a consequence of rejecting truth, rejecting Him, rejecting His Word. And so don't be set on your own agenda that you would harden your heart. That's the, the, the Pharisees were so set in their agendas. They were so concerned that about losing their positions that they would refuse to see and believe even though there were the proof already that they'd seen about Jesus and who He is. There is a case. God has built a case against those who reject Christ. There are severe consequences if you continually reject Christ until it is too late. And you will only have two possible responses. You would either worship God in truth and spirit or you would say, and respond like the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the crowd. And you would say, I reject you. I reject Christ in the way I live my life. I'll close with these questions for you. How much of what you're doing right now is simply a religious ritual and a self-serving hypocrisy. You say one thing, but you do the other. You say you love God, but you don't trust and obey Him. How much of what you do in your everyday life is lived in the continuous presence, the conscious presence of our God and Savior and Jesus Christ? If you find yourself convicted of this, you find yourself that you are guilty of this case, it's not yet too late. Repent and believe, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful, Lord, that you have this word for us as the lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Thank you, O Lord, that we can check continuously our hearts. And we know, Lord, just like sheep, we are prone to wander away. We are prone to listen to voices within and from without. And we would start to follow them. But I thank you, O Lord, that you would allow us times like this, a people to gather together and devote themselves to the Word, to encourage one another. I pray, Lord, for discouraged saints right now who have not been doing that and have, not, have been missing out, Lord, on the promise of being encouraged and strengthened. I pray that we would dig down deep, not base our happiness and, and, and security on how well we're doing in the world today, but really, Lord, on the solid rock of truth that you have in store for us in this life and the secure joy and treasure we have in the life eternal. I pray that you would remind us, O Lord, that you are continuously seeking a people who will truly worship you. May we repent from false worship. May we repent from hypocrisy. May we repent from our uh, sins that we have been convincing ourselves that are okay and turn to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.